All right, guys, welcome back to the Sacramento Horror Film Festival. We have another awesome guest for you right now, film director, producer. She has done so much that we cannot wait to talk to her about. But uh, most prominently for us horror fans, let me welcome Nightmare on Elm Street, the final Nightmare director, Rachel Talloway. How are you doing? Okay. Hi. Hi. It's a uh, long, it's, it's a far cry from being at an actual panel, I must say. There's something so, yeah, Zoom about it. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, the, the unpersonalness of the whole panel thing, you, you know, being able to have the live crowd and being able to kind of feed off of the energy of the room is something that is very missed right now because yeah. of the pandemic. But, but here I, am we are. Sure that, I am sure everybody who is sitting back and, and watching is excited to uh, get to hear you share some of your stories throughout your career with us. And, uh, you know, as far as Sinister Creature Kong goes and Sack Horror goes, I think, you know, the first thing that would predominantly come to fans of your work mind is the fact that you directed, you know, the installment of... Nightmare on Elm Street. You know, you in all of the first six movies, so I started on part one. Um, and then I moved my way up through the production ranks, so I was the producer of part three and part four. Um, and so then I wasn't available to do parts five because um, I was producing Crybaby and, uh, for John Waters. And so I um, ended up, but I ended up producing a film that the head of New Line, Bob Shea, and was directing. And so when it came around to part six, I was like, okay, my turn. And it made it harder for him to say, we don't hire first time directors because he I had just produced for him as a first time director. Um, so my deep domain knowledge of the series uh, helped me get the job. I know you, and I blanked on the fact that you were there from the beginning. because I know you were doing like more behind the scenes work when the franchise was starting, weren't you? Like doing kind of like a, digital type stuff for it? I was, uh, I started as the, I had worked with Line as an accountant. I worked as a PA on my very first film I worked on. And then I became an accountant because of my math background. And I had done an accounting on a film they did called Alone in the Dark. And that's how I got known to them. And um, so after that, I, they asked me to then, then again to be the accountant on, I had moved to LA and they asked me to do uh, be the accountant on the first nightmare, but I had been working with Roger Corman and didn't want to do accounting anymore. So I said, okay, if I get a production job. So I ended up as an assistant production manager um, credit, but really most of what I did was locations. When I wasn't doing accounting, okay. I was doing locations. So I found the nightmare house. I found Glenn's house. I found uh, Tina's house. Um, and then I went on and they came around for the next one and they said, will you do the same thing? And I said, no, I'd like to production manage. And this, this is a pretty well-known story in my, in the horror fans. And then when they came around to the next one, I said, I'd like to produce. And then that was so successful that they gave me a job at New Line. What was it about the Nightmare House and just, just being a, a film student graduate having to do like location scouting classes and stuff like that? After graduation, I actually went and drove and found the nightmare on Elm Street House. What was it as a as a location scout, location manager type brain? Because it was so so close to downtown LA, where in the movie you would never guess that. So when we when we found it, I was like, "Well, this is this is rad to have this much of a residential looking street." And then here's Sunset Boulevard, literally so close. Is that what was that got you with that? I mean, we we were supposed to be in Ohio, and uh, so we yeah we were the the challenge was to find Ohio in L.A. Um, so having grown up in the East Coast, I knew what we were looking for, and there are only there aren't a huge number of streets that don't have pine trees, uh, palm trees everywhere. Yeah. So it, it limited where we were looking, and it was one of the most central ones. The, the real challenge was that Wes had scripted Tina's, uh, sorry, Nancy's house and Glenn's house directly across the street from each other, and them to be able to look window to window. And he didn't want to cheat it. He wanted to really be able to go window to window. We weren't able to actually do that. 
Um, we were one, they were kitty cornered to each other. Glenn's mm. house was one over, but you know, knocking on doors and saying, which is going to be Nancy's house. And then is there a house directly across the street that fits the bill as well, where the windows can look at each other. So that, that was a, that, one of the challenges. It's still, it's still the nightmare house, man. Like they haven't, having just been there like a month ago, it looked exactly <laughs> the same. it's crazy. Yeah. Um, but when you it's still there, right in the middle of Hollywood or West Hollywood, it's still there, yeah, shrubs and red door and everything. The uh, it lives. Yeah, they... The uh, but when you get your turn, you know, finally you've worked your way to the director's chair, you know, of your Nightmare on Elm Street film. That process of you know, because all of all the the characters in that era of horror, whether it be Freddy, Jason, Michael, you know, they each have a distinctive look. Now they may be in the same vein, but there is a, you know, there is a difference of uh, uh, Freddy in the original and to Freddy to yours, there's an evolution there. And, uh, you know, same goes for a, a Michael Mask in four versus a Michael Mask in, in, in the original. But what what was there about your Freddy when you finally got into the to chair with Robert, did you have a particular, you know, I want him to be this kind of, uh, this kind of a Freddy Krueger, or were you just kind of like, let's like, continue from where we left off? Um, I was very much, let's continue where we left off, that what Ro Robert was most comfortable with is where I wanted to go. We weren't really re-evolving him. We understood that lighting, that keeping him in the dark was critical, um, and that became very difficult when we were in 3D. Um, where you need lots of light. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we understood from Nightmare One that the sort of, and um, so trying to keep that creepiness there, um, but also Nightmare Five had been less successful because it had been so dark and so violent. And so the intent was to make it uh, a lighter version that was uh, much happier at the box office. I'm often, um, uh, uh, in terms of the box office, that was a big deal for New Line. Um, and I find it difficult because I'm often castigated for having made the funny one. Um, and uh, I, that was very much the direction in terms of um, the, the, the box office at that point, because they had made so many films so quickly that there was a dropping off of interest in Freddy. And so, um, that that was purposely gone lighter in in for Nightmare Six, but um, so I get really tired of of uh, the online criticism about that. I, I mean, I, especially given that it's you know it's like okay, this is my first film. I've done a hundred and something hours of work since then, and I get I, I still see people say things, and, and I know I shouldn't read comments. But so people say people oh. saying I can't I can't look at that, at any of her work after Freddie. But oh, that's super fair to my to my work since then. That I think is something that only someone who has been there would appreciate. Like I think <laughs> I think that you know if you told like you telling me that story or if you tell anyone who you know, kind of has that appreciation who's tried to make a film, maybe not even professionally, but just tried to make a film to even kind of begin to wrap their mind around the fact that, I mean, hey, man, I'll, I'll virtually pat you on the back, Rachel, since <laughs> your nightmare on Elm Street, your resume is uh, pretty substantial. So to A, um, you know, say that is, is is from a film perspective is just so ignorant. It's unbelievable. I don't even want to talk about it anymore. But <laughs> I probably should have brought it up. It's just on my mind because I I read recently because my new Netflix film is which you know I will have to talk about my new yeah. Netflix film is coming out uh, in the middle of October and I literally read somebody say who was saying well that's too bad because I can't watch anything that she does. And you know, like because of Freddie, and I'm like, okay, let's negate. You know, I'm glad you felt like that. And also, how many years ago was it? I was about to say, I'm glad you're still holding on to that grudge. <laughs> yeah, 30, 30 years. That was my first film. Was my first um, I would do it differently now. 
<laughs> it would be a different film now because the, the 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 I mean, first of all, because of CGI, but the um, the 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 zeitgeist of the, the audience is so different now. The zeitgeist of the audience is so different now, and so I think it's really important to see films in their historical context as well. It's important to understand who Freddie was then, and right. it's a and it's the same thing as reading. Yeah, I mean, you read a lot of criticism as if the world was the same then, and it wasn't. No, so that is, yeah, well, that, that's a really good point. I think that's where, um, you know, there's certain horror movies now that draw upon that era, and then in the word, you know, camp, 80s camp, 70s camp gets thrown up, and I think a lot of that is said not just in just but with affection just because of what you just said like a freddy in 2020 would be completely different than a freddy back then but a freddy back then is what everyone kind of wanted as a freddy so you know i'm sorry 30 years ago their taste wasn't exactly the same as yours in 2020 but try and to I'm it is fascinating that but having been around for all the test screenings of parts three and parts four and five and six and seeing what the audience responded to. And I love the fact that the audience loves Freddie, but the audience loves the kids too. And mm -hmm. so you would go to these screenings and the audience would be going crazy uh, cheering Freddie, but they'd be crazy cheering the kids as well. And so, and you say, well, how do you reconcile that? And that's just fascinating, not um, problematic it's just okay well we love freddy as an as a anti-hero as the bad guy but we also want the kids to win ultimately so yeah. and that's fabulous and so understanding that you can't you, it's harder to intellectualize um and contextualize that but having an appreciation of, of how much we want our kids to be heroic um and we so and we want them to be fighting freddy because that's them uh, fighting their own demons. That's cool. I mean, that's important. Yeah. It's not just love of Freddy. It was love of the whole. It was lo love of the whole, and it was love of the. What works so well with Freddy, of course, is the nightmares because it gave us that. You didn't have to worry about going into the basement. <laughs> you were going into whatever world we could create. Secret. Right. No, for sure. That uh, that makes him. I think pretty terrifying in the sense that he is maybe delving into thoughts and parts of your mind you don't even know exist yet and pulling out fears that are just beyond your wildest imagination that's the nightmare on elm street it, it, it's awesome man it is one of those mount rushmore horror franchises but you know you have also um you know pretty pretty early on you were uh doing one that a film that a past Sinister Creature Con guest, Lori Petty was involved with, with uh, Tank Girl, which is a very cool, like you're in getting ready to talk to you and just seeing how much that you've done, you, ve you very much have like this, uh, like the horror aesthetic and then you have like the comic aesthetic to your work. And, uh, you know, Tank Girl is almost kind of like a, a medium of the two where you have, you know, the Tank Girl scenario, but the way that that film is shot and like the funness of that film is very much like a, a comic book movie. How was that one to work on? Um, Tank Girl's very much my, that was my, it's really my pet project. It really defines me the best in terms of who I am. I mean, the, I was a punk or I was a wannabe punk. I mean, I didn't actually, you know, uh, put safety pins through my cheeks just in my in the holes that were already there in my um but I love punk music and I love and I'm still I think rebellion and is uh and protest I think the, the background of punk being protest against the UK and 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 also just protest against the sort of um establishment generally against the establishment I've always been the person who railed against uh, doing what I was told to do while still fitting in um while right. still fall, fall, uh, so broken a little bit that way. Um, but Tank Girl really was, I mean, Hollywood at that point didn't have any real female heroes. Um, 
And uh, it just seemed like this spoke to all the cool women I knew that you could speak your mind and do what you want to do and not give a shit. And that's, um, and, and take no prisoners. And that's who Frank Tank Girl is and always is. And there's part of Tank Girl in every woman I know. Doesn't matter if they're introverted, doesn't matter if there's that part of that. That's the inner, the, the Tank Girl is the inner self that you've held on to that hasn't been oppressed by the patriarchy. You know, the- so he did a lot of designs for us. He worked really closely with Catherine Hardwick, who was our production designer. Um, the Catherine Hardwick, who was our production designer on it. Uh, and so I wanted to be true to him and it, not not earlier comics. Was he, did he get to come out to set when you guys were filming it? There's some great pictures of him and, and Alan Martin, the writer, um, and their friends sitting by the pool in white bathrobes. And, you know, they were so young. I mean, I wasn't very old, but they were really young. And just getting having a Hollywood moment sitting by the pool and the in the bathrooms and 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 uh, acting like you know they couldn't believe that this little comic was being made into a uh, into a fil- into a studio film. Yeah, you know, one being a fan of the show, um, having to find where I could get the BBC Channel at to be able to watch uh, being younger uh, the Doctor Who franchise and going back and seeing you know the the previous seasons and getting into the culture of there being different doctors and um, just kind of immersing yourself into that story but you getting to be attached to that franchise was it was a huge deal when you finally got notified that you were you were coming on board, and it still really is a huge deal for you to be able to say that that you got to work on that franchise. Is but how was that um, getting to put your stamp on a franchise that seemed like um, it meant an awful lot for you? Yeah, I worked really hard. I mean, when I saw the reboot of, of Doctor Who, I said, I need to work on this. Um, I was blown away by it. had sort of the Nightmare on Elm Street elements in terms of um, they had these major effects that mm-hmm. I was like, how are they doing this on television? How is the, they're doing this on a BBC budget? What is going on here? And then it had, and so I'm thinking about all the skills that I learned from that. And then like the best of, and, and, and this history with the show and then I saw how brilliant uh, Russell T. Davies' writing was for the first uh, couple of uh, series and uh, with David Tennant. And I was, I have to get on this. So um, I called my agent and said, can I have an interview? And we interviewed several times. And I, the final interview I had, I said, I don't know how to tell you what what's missing. And I, I need to ask you, like, what's missing in my conversation to tell you how to do this? Um, because you never know as a director interviewing what it is that they need to hear. And so I finally just thought, I'm going to say, what do you need to know that I haven't shown that I can do to, that I will desperately want to work on this. And then nothing happened. And then <laughs> for like another year. And, uh, okay. I thought it, and so I just assumed that it was because I was living in, uh, uh, in Canada, which was definitely a, um, uh, you know, I wasn't in the UK. It wasn't uh, convenient to them. I, I always figured that if I was right there, it would have been different. Um, right. uh, perhaps that was just my uh, uh, justification. Yeah. But And they just called me up and they said, um, uh, the finale is open and Stephen's written, it's a two-parter and Stephen Moffat's written it. And um, can you interview in a couple of days? And I'm like, oh yeah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so we had an interview that it wasn't even an interview on the phone, just sort of a, a do you understand, you know, that we don't have a lot of money and uh, I'm, I'm there. And then they said, okay, we'll see you in a couple of days. And I'm like, 
did that mean? And then it was, it was a, the interview was on a Saturday. So it like wasn't confirmed with my agent till Monday. So right. I'm sitting there going, well, did that actually, did they actually say, see you in a couple of months? See you shortly? Or did they, did they actually mean that? Or was that just one of those, was that hyperbole? Mm. Do I have to <laughs> So I had to wait for two days to find out. And then my main objective, I mean, first of all, the scripts were, the scripts are absolutely genius. So that makes life vastly easier. Okay. And yeah. my main objective was to figure out how to fit in as well as I possibly could, how to understand what everybody needed and just be there for the show no matter what. So I went in not to say, I'm going to make the best Doctor Who ever. It's just, what is what is the best Doctor Who ever? What is it that Stephen wants? What is it that Peter Capaldi wants? Can I be the most for, uh, uh, the, for all the creatives on the show? How can I figure out what they want the most and supply the best version of that? And that was really my, that, that's my objective. And the scripts were so good. So really, uh, and working directly with the day-to-day -day producer, Pete Bennett, it was basically never, how do we figure out ne never to say no to Steven? So, and this will be appreciated by the horror fans. There's was a moment where um, we had somebody pulled out of the window of a plane and Steven had written, or just his feet, if we can't afford the visual effect. And mm -hmm. I looked at them and I said, I know how to do this. I see <laughs> what we did at the end of Nightmare on Elm Street with pulling Ronnie Blakely through the window. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. going to do that old trick. And so we uh, took San, uh, Sanjeev Bhaskar out the plane by yanking by, by the mm -hmm. old trick that we used on Nightmare. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that was just one of those. There's no way we're going to cheap out and do the we're going to give them the whole effect and we're going to do it without it breaking the bank. So that's where, that's a good example for the best. When you uh, are filming out in like the UK or any place that's not, you know, home country at the time, is there a uh, other filming <clears throat> location that you would, you know, you would like to be at like filming at the UK, you know, when I, when I hear that, like my mind automatically goes to like, man, it would be cool to like work at Pinewood Studios one day. <laughs> Just that's where Star Wars was filmed at. Yeah. Like, is there a spot, you know, whether it, it doesn't even have to be a sound stage that you either have gotten to work at or still want to work at that's kind of like one of some place that's eluded you that you haven't gone to? Are there is a secret room in the back of Big ben, Big ben, in the top of the tower of Big Ben, that I'm desperate to at least see, to get up to. Apparently you have to have your, you have to get uh, uh, an MP's uh, note to get on a list to be allowed to go see this secret room. Oh, um, and I would love to go up there. I really wanted to film there on um, Sherlock. We couldn't even get up there. Uh, we weren't allowed to get up there. Um, I. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, I, it was really incredibly amazing to shoot um, at St. Paul's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. So I think every time you're in one of the iconic uh, locations in the UK, I mean, I'm particularly in love with the UK. I particularly love London. Um, so every minute I'm filming in London is as hard as it is, is absolutely magical for me. Um, I was jealous of Mr. Bean when they drove the mini around Harrods. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, but I like the historical places. I mean, I would love to shoot inside St. Paul's and not just outside it. Um, I'd love to shoot in the Science Museum too. So, mm. um, in, in the UK, that's one of my that's one of my um, uh, happy places. It's a right really on. great museum, um, and the Natural History Museum is one of the most beautiful buildings in London. So. Yeah, there's quite a few places in London, but it was pretty much, is this my life that I have St. Paul's Cathedral to myself and I'm standing in here with Michelle Gomez and Peter Capaldi inside the door with like somebody playing the organ and two guards and us. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then some Cybermen come in. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty much this is not my life moment. <laughs> If you, you've gotten to do a bunch of shows where you are, you know, you're in for like an episode and then you're on to the next project. Is that hard? 
Or is that? It's a different, so doing American television as a regular episodic director is a different mindset. And you have to, I mean, when you first come into it and you're just a cog in the machine, mm -hmm. um, you have to check your uh, creativity to some degree and your ownership of your project. And it takes a, it takes a little bit of adjustment to realize that your job is entirely to satisfy the showrunner um, and to be a cog in the machine, to be an incredibly uh, giving cog in the machine <laughs> um, and generous cog in the machine, but also to just, there's just these moments that you can make things your own. And those are really satisfying moments. And it's a really, usually a really nice community or you hope it's going to be a nice community, the people who have been together for a long time and fitting into that community is important. So, and, and sort of bringing uh, confidence and experience to get you through the episodes and understand what you're, um, and, and, and still gets little bits of magic in there. I mean, there's pretty much every episode I've done, there are, there are at least a couple of shots where I think, yeah, that, that was good. Yes, I gave them what they wanted, and yeah, I got to do a couple of special things. I had a moment on Ally McBeal, David Kelly um, very much had a structure for how you shot scenes in the offices. So mm -hmm. there was a vocabulary that you were asked to use. And there was one moment where I wanted to do something slightly different. And you could tell like there was tension in the entire um, place that I was gonna spend a little bit of extra time to do something. And he really liked it and it ended up in the show. And I'm super mm. proud of that. I'm really proud of that moment because you, they said, we don't know how David's gonna feel about it. Um, and I remember the editor saying, this is really effective and it's really good for David to see that sometimes uh, trying something different uh, can work as well, but it didn't diminish from the, um, it, it didn't diminish from his writing. It didn't dim diminish from the the importance of the close-ups, which um, was just a little bit wider and a little bit odder. And at that moment, it was appropriate. And that's what you're always trying to do is make the camera do something um, appropriate that just tells the audience a little bit, something a little bit different. Your your body of work, you've worked. I mean, you said Ally McBill, which was the, the hit show. I can remember, you know. I still can remember the TV stingers of Ally McBeal popping up, you know, on Fox in between, you know, leading up to the days and stuff. But you, you've worked on so many different shows and you, you touched on this fact when we were doing, talking about the nightmare stuff is you've kind of gotten to see TV evolve from the inside. What has that, what has that been like? It's interesting because I'll go back now and I'll think, oh, I kind of like that episode I did of Without a Trace. I want to go back and look at something to do with it, maybe for a real piece or to show somebody something. And mm -hmm. I'll realize that I only have a video cassette and that we shot in four by three. Mm -hmm. And it and if you can even find a way to transfer, the, I mean, then you'll go, okay, well, I need to find a digital transfer, but it's still in four by three and four by three format is so ugly. Yeah. And... <laughs> So you're like, how did we do that? How? And they were so, in those days, they were so adamant that there was no way that we would ever go widescreen. And why would you ever do that? And yeah. I mean, widescreen being 16 by nine, not even being right. wide widescreen. And now with, so working in the UK was really, really satisfying because already they were not, they were shooting in the wider aspect ratio anyway, um, with higher quality. And uh, because there's more lines, I mean, it's technical, but it, the quality of television broadcasting in the UK is better anyway. Um, and, or was then when it was broadcast and not digital fiber right, optic. Right. Right. Uh, just in case somebody's jumping all over me now going, it's not better now because we're all digital and we're all, I know. She can't get the, the TV lines right and from Nightmare, yeah. on, Nightmare on Elm Street, yada, yada, yada. But the, um, the, the, uh, so in the UK, when you got to, uh, the, there was the, the limited series. So I, what I worked on in the UK were all limited series. And so that approach, which is now the cable approach, the, the premium uh, approach, is now the preferred approach in the US for the higher quality shows. But Americans weren't doing that. They were on that gravy train of 22, 21, 22, 24 episodes um, in a season. 
And so that was just complete. There were two completely different worlds. And when that changed, and really a lot of that was Netflix um, with uh, House of Cards and mm. the limited series, the bingeable series, and then H and HBO, the limited series, the higher quality series. And that changed everything. And of course, that's the the gold standard in terms for a director in terms of opportunity to do more um, and to. And and that now, of course, all the I mean, many of the best writers appreciate that that, that television is the place to be, and so that's changed things a huge amount. Um, and now that we're I mean, and now with COVID, everything has changed in terms of yeah, no, no, no question. Yeah, no, no, no movie theaters. No, I mean, everything has changed, and so and and uh, it's been interesting working for Netflix and seeing how they market to. Um, they market to you individually. Yeah. They know they know what they know what you watch, and they're marketing to you individually. So if you look at your friends' Netflix, they'll have a different picture from, or your kids' Netflix, they'll have a different poster for each for a show than they might. I might have. I confound them because I'm always watching weird things because we in the industry are, you know, watching different things for to know what's on. It may not be my passion. I, um, I don't follow a, I've got to watch all the horror shows because who knows what I'm working on next. Um, yeah. But so I might find myself watching, or, or you might be watching a French show that is not your type of show, but uh, so that type of targeted marketing, which is absolutely fascinating um, is affecting things as well. But yeah, going from the sort of old American television and the four by three and the, vocabulary, the comfort and the vocabulary of what it was like in your own home to really curating your own content, which is what we do on uh, in, in our now split uh, ability to choose our, our, our uh, content and our networks. And it's interesting to you, you, know, you having done some of your latest stuff on like a streaming platform, like I know there was an episode of Doom Patrol that you were attached to. And there was an episode of um, you were you were working you did some stuff like for, with the boys didn't you? No. Amazon. Oh no. no. I haven't done anything for Amazon yet. Um, I've, I've been invited to, but not been available. The uh, but the Doom Patrol stuff compared to like take something that you did work on for an episode of, like the Winchesters was supernatural. Um, as far as comparison and contrasting, like they're in the same vein as far as a dark universe, but you go Doom Patrol route and you uh, you can almost get away with more because they're on like, they started on their, their streaming service. Moving that way, as far as a directorial career, do you like being able to do that more just so you, you don't have the constraints of like a... Uh, network television does that does that bother you or do you like i'm a I, I, i'm an oddball um and i like the eclectic stuff so i had been reading doom patrol since i mean hilariously i had the whole series of comics for the area that they were so the um all the act i mean and i had my husband send. i didn't realize that that was the section the that season so i had my husband send them all out to me so i could get them all autographed and everybody was like you had these original comics <laughs> wow um and it was one of the series of comics that i uh collected because it was so odd i was always a big fan of um the anything that was vertigo so mm -hmm. um, a huge fan of preacher um mm -hmm. and uh so, yeah, I have oddball tastes and I have edgy tastes. Um, so, yeah, so I like to be, I, I, so I love Doom Patrol because it was so weird. Um, and I liked watching it. I didn't know where the series was going and I loved watching it after my episode and going, did they really go there? Did they really go there? <laughs> That's so amazing. I have what not was I know you, you know, you weren't there for an extended amount of time, but you were there for a fun episode. What was, what was that cast like? Because I mean, everybody, the more casting announcements 
that they made. I remember like all the nerds that I hang out, you know, our 30 something year old nerds, like, you know, reading the comic books when we're a kid. I'm like, they got him. And then all of a sudden they dropped the bomb of, Oh my God, we got Brendan Fraser on board. And it was, it was the matter of, you know, Marvel, you know, cinematically had just hit after hit after hit. And it was like, me and some of my best friends are pretty DC faithful. And then the DC app came out and Titans came out and we were like, okay, can you see us now? And then the trailer for doom patrol came out and we were like, Hey man, like they're starting to make that oh, dark yeah. night come back right now. And, but what, what was that like getting to like see them as a group working with all those guys? Well, it's so interesting because you've got two main characters who aren't played by the actors. Yes. So, so you're playing by your, your, and when I started, they had, I mean, I did the third episode. So mm -hmm. there was some footage from the pilot and then they were shooting the other one while I was prepping. So there were very little knowledge about what it was. All I could do was go on set and see, I didn't have um, much to work with. So, so, mm -hmm. and then you've got these uh, physical actors who are amazing acting the roles but they aren't the roles who are going to vote they aren't the people who are going to voice the roles so mm. um and then you have the uh like a the days i worked with matt bomer when he was matt bomer i mean <laughs> when he was a negative man right, right, um, right so you're getting both of those elements and still everybody's working together and working it all out i didn't work with i didn't work with brendan fraser at all um to my disappointment yeah. uh, but um yeah, and I, uh, um, and Chief, I only worked with his puppet. It was mm -hmm. really super, uh, which was kind of great too. It was really fun to do marionettes. That that was something I'd never done before, except in except producing Nightmare Three. And that was a different type of. We didn't have Nazi marionettes. We had <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had puppeting people's veins. Yeah, um, and marionettes. <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah, so so there's a lot about being early on in Doom Patrol that was about determining what it was. And that was really uh, fun and interesting. And uh, I love that cast. I mean, I loved everything about working on that. It was challenging and, and crazy and, and, yeah, it was good. And what about uh, your upcoming work with... Uh, Netflix, you have a new project that we would be able to, uh, or we should be able to look forward to sooner than later that you just got uh, just got done with, right? Yeah. So I've been working for the last year, and almost a year and a half, on a kid's uh, monster movie um, called The Babysitter's Guide to Monster Hunting. And it um, I, now it's going to sound like my ad. So I hold up my book and say... Babysitter's Guide to Monster Hunting on October 15th on uh, drops on Netflix on October 15th. Um, and it's based on a series of books and it's a family monster, uh, uh, Halloween monster movie. And it's um, fun and scary and a family Halloween movie. Um, and it was, for me, it was an, a challenge because trying to make it family enough. They kept saying, you're making it too scary. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm good at the horror part. Uh, but you know, I've worked really hard to become good at the horror part and understand the horror part and understand tension. And, and that's become part of my vocabulary in terms of as a filmmaker. And, and often I'm told that my Doctor Who's are very scary. Um, so trying to mitigate sort of, you know, do play the games that because it does have to be a monster movie and I want it to skew up so that teenagers want to watch it as well. I want it to be for the whole family, but I also don't want the letters from, you know, I don't think your four year old should be watching it, even though yeah. minimal, minimal monstering. Um, so yeah, that's a balance for, for Netflix as well to try and find the, that exact balance of making it. So we mitigate it with a lot of humor. So it's a very Rachel movie from the standpoint of there's, humor and there's scares but you're always breaking the scares with the with the um, humor 
but it's not campy like Freddy. It's not, it's, it's uh, like my, it doesn't have the eighties horror camp. It's much more of a straight ahead kids monster movie. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's one of the fun stuff to watch in October. It's always fun to watch, you know, the horror yeah. movies year round, but in October, you know, like your Hocus Pocus type movies, those are always the good ones to kind of dig out once a year, the nostalgic, give you the nostalgic feel of the best time of and the it's year. And it's, it's very female forward. It's very, I mean, very important to me to constantly be in, empowering to girls, it's very, there's certain tank, the references to tank girl, um, for sure. There's not, there's a call out to Nightmare on Elm Street that the fans will appreciate. So there's a few things for the whole family. Um, and I, I mean, for the, for the horror fans in, out there as well, um, there are a few Easter eggs, uh, but, but very much important to keep that female power and it's STEM. It's, it's very diverse and it's very STEM forward as well. So we worked really hard to make it a smart, smart, funny, fun romp, Halloween romp. Cause who's going trick or treating this year? Like, yeah, that, that is, you know, a, put, put out your, you know, hang out your stay away from my house signs. Yeah. That's, it's an interesting thing. There's a, a local, uh, haunted house in the town that we live in that uh, is doing trick or treating instead of the haunted house, but they are doing trick or treating with these PVC pipes that are probably big enough to get a softball, and they are loading plastic balls filled with candy, and they're sending them down the PVC pipes Aww. so the kids can catch them on the other side. Um, so there's there's ways to do it, and you know maybe you cap the night off and you watch uh, Rachel's movie on Netflix, man. And uh, but we uh, you know we look forward to seeing what you got coming down the pipeline uh, for what the future holds. You uh, are constantly uh, attached, it would seem, to one of our favorite shows and or uh, films, not just in horror, but in the uh, the nerd culture appreciative as well so rachel we uh, we look forward to seeing what you got in store for us next man and i thank you for uh, taking the time out to do our interview today can i talk about one other thing oh yeah go for it um i have another film uh that i made a to that i produced that is a tiny indie film um mm -hmm. that's starting to make the festival circuit called An Introvert's Guide to High School. Oh. And it's um, based on uh, uh, the prejudices against uh, introverts. So I feel like many of the convention, the con audience will understand this movie and appreciate the sort of lack of, lack of support for introverts. Um, and so it's a black comedy um, it was made in six days with, with um, all improvised, uh, but it's something I think is important. It's a topic I think is important. I mean, you know, I could go on about uh, my many topics that I think are important. And, um, you know, I want to hold up a glass of champagne to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is an inspiration to me. But I feel like it's an underappreciated topic, how difficult it is for introverts. And I feel like I see that at conventions when people find it hard to come and just uh, say hello at the tables, at your autograph tables. Mm -hmm. And I have a great deal of appreciation and respect for breaking through that. And I feel like there's a real misunderstanding of introverts and that's why we made this movie. Um, but it is a black comedy. So, um, and I hope we'll get enough distribution that I can <laughs> tell you where you're gonna be able to see it. Well, that is something as someone who's my wife and my Self. We've worked with you know, in special education, high yeah. school, elementary school for, for years. That is, I will seek that one out because that is a movie that uh, I feel like adults and teenagers and you know anybody who can grasp the subject material should probably sit down and watch and try to take in. Uh, that is so good on you for another uh, for another <laughs> one that we got to so check. Out. Okay, uh, I just had to put that that uh, pitch in too because I it's just a little a tiny passion passion piece. No, for sure, and 
you know, we will look forward to hopefully seeing it down after it, it, it does its thing in the festival circuit. Uh, but again, Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. And, uh, we will uh, we will look forward to checking out both of those films really, really soon. Thanks. And thank you, viewers. And stay safe. Stay well. Wear a mask. <laughs>